If humans are bad with exponential growth, then yes, we can easily fail to detect ubiquitous real dangers in nature, but then we can also easily fail to detect false alarms from both, one, those who have studied and know how to select and weave the sensitive initial variables. Being human, they still have some blind spots and worldviews, even though they attempt to minimize their impact. Two, those who amplify or parrot false alarms with many more blind spots, worldviews, and side motives intertwined. Omitting these cofactors in this crisis is intellectually dishonest. Dismissing it can also cause great harm. Many of the scientists I've heard explain the data behind the COVID-19 pandemic suggest much more reasonable reactions than the media, government, and public. They also don't seem to be able to effectively calm or balance a serious panic given a flood of information. If not flood the zone of accurate information because it's a so flood, flood, flood good zone. information. Okay, others. I personally do not believe that trying to shut things down in terms of information is either practical or desirable. And we do have, I think, a, a couple of strategies that are available to us, one of which is the flood strategy, second of which is relying and informing and equipping trusted uh, sources of information with the facts so they can then pass that on. Neil deGrasse Tyson asked about this grand human control experiment. Will people listen to scientists? Yes, it seems most people did listen, quite uncritically. But no, scientists should not be the new priesthood. And pop science is more social conditioning than science. Instead, scientific inquiry should inform we, the people who are supposed to control our governments. It is intellectually dishonest to declare a false dichotomy that societal participants have a choice to trust the science or not. That is a monolithic, unscientific concept which promotes othering, deeper division, and potentially violence whenever humans are, quote, on a war footing. In a scientific society, people should be fully informed about the uncertainties in each model and related fields, and consciously understand how actionable they find each model. If we are not thoroughly informed about the known unknowns in a field or debate, then we can't even know how much the world's experts know they don't know. If our society has representative governance, then everybody must be able to understand and question the basics of the scientific fields being used to govern us, a modern redress of grievances. Otherwise, how can we judge the actions of our elected officials? How else can we give informed consent with our votes for or against exponentially impactful societal experiments? For one baseline requirement, Let's think about the cases where big picture predictions for key metrics are significantly different than observational data. In those cases, emerging evidence should demand a serious reevaluation of how actionable those models are. That would truly raise the scientific method and inquiry up in society as it is applied to public policy. Our society is well past the debate of, quote, listening to the science or not, as a supermajority are absolutely forced to listen when needed. Instead, we can focus on debates on what level of uncertainty we collectively think are actionable in each specific situation, while respecting the consent of our neighbors. I've been actively trying to learn about the known risks. Given the body of science I've seen thus far for the novel subfield of COVID-19 pandemic impact, the known uncertainties have moved these models far outside a range that I would justify any unprecedented totalitarian policies. No group has a monopoly on documenting evidence-based inquiry with thorough references. If you think only the most educated and promoted scientists should control the world, then please be honest about your totalitarian, authoritarian, and or undemocratic tendencies. But with existing technology, we should already be entering an age of fewer rulers, not more rulers. If one sensitive input variable is one order of magnitude off, then the end prediction might be several orders of magnitude off. A small error in one premise of a data model or mainstream narrative can grow exponentially into a massive error in expectations. Working with data points that are challenging or impossible to measure will add further exponential uncertainty to a model. 
I thought we all agreed about some things during the Nuremberg trials. Therefore, controlled experiments to inform pandemic reaction models must be relatively rare due to high fatality risks. Not all of the harder sciences have an equal quantity and quality of data to inform their best conclusions. We have significant uncertainty on a majority of sensitive variable inputs to some of our most popular consensus nonlinear models. Underemphasizing the layered uncertainties does not help increase trust in the science and consensus. It does not advance the goals of a more evidence-based society to bully people or politics with scientific predictions that very well may be very wrong. No theory is too big to fail. Good science should be able to defend itself without bullies. The slur denier evolved in reference to tragic historical events that it is intended to evoke, triggering any listener. But how exactly can one deny the latest modeled predictions about future events? I guess if denial opposes truths, then you must think these models predicting the future are close enough to represent truth. Before data exists to endorse or refute such models, I would call any such position a belief, perhaps informed, but often not. I suppose you could say I am in denial of your belief, but I suspect that's not what you intended by such othering. As scientific modeling influences society more, we apparently need massive propaganda pushes to educate people on the uncertainty in complex nonlinear modeling. Yes, scientists model nature with everyone's safety in mind, but they too are limited by data, blind spots, and sometimes narrow groupthink. If we further reduce the number of people who can fully understand what's going on with policy, then widespread understanding and skeptical are even more important to maximize safety. Not just science literacy, but enough understanding for substantive debate and heavy steel manning. It is also disrespectful to treat us like children given ongoing crises of science. Authoritarian states treat their subjects like children. With representative governance, we, the people, treat the state like a child, also guilty of sometimes being exponentially dangerous. Do you think technocratic and representative governance are not mutually exclusive? To have both, you'll have to wait until the vast majority of the society is significantly literate of science, exponential growth, and the uncertainty in your favorite nonlinear model of the year. If that's your utopia, I think you're going to have to get cracking in that direction stream more intellectual debates with more than an hour in the weeds, and putting your patience hat on for another 50 years. Sorry, not my utopia, not my problem. I would prefer incrementally decentralized solutions with calm and informed reactions driven by bottom-up open source evidence. If we depend on data models, then they must be heavily replicated and iterated models with high degrees of predictive certainty. The smaller the scale, the greater the possible consent. Call me an idealist, but I truly believe that informed consent matters. I did not think that this position was extremist. Whether or not it was valid to treat this pandemic as an existential threat, I am always touched and impressed with the immense decentralized aid in scary times. For the record, no, I do not consent to give up any of our remaining freedoms or rights to modern priesthoods like scientism or national security without overwhelming evidence. No, I'm not dumb enough to physically fight any piece of the modern totalitarian tiptoe, nor encourage others to do so. Don't do that. Don't feed the most dangerous troll in town. Yes. I support collectively taking reasonable precautions against countless natural and man-made threats, especially when supported by a majority of existing evidence. Evidently, the public needs an educational campaign on the reliability of extrapolations made from very sparse data. With minimal evidence of COVID-19 and proposed countermeasures, people were asked to jump and many asked how high. It seems highly unlikely and underdocumented that the mitigation and containment efforts will have a significant reduction in the overall spread of COVID-19. From my personal experience in rural Maryland, I would be shocked if our orders could be scientifically claimed to have a noticeable impact despite being unprecedented. 
As far as I can tell thus far, the scientific burden for extraordinary proof is still on those supporting unprecedented forms of population control. I'm always open to integrating new and better evidence. Learning. After the curve of tragedy passes, many will want to claim that semi-totalitarian measures were primarily responsible for a relative victory. You can replicate popular estimates of simplified exponential growth models at home and start looking at the baseline situation to which more mitigation predictions were overlaid. It is an extraordinary claim to say that all the half measures ordered in some countries and states will reduce cumulative deaths by 80%, let alone 4 to 6 doublings thus far at the beginning of April, or 94 to 98% of what the official consensus variables had predicted. In my mind, those voices have to provide strong evidence on the science behind each measure if they want to justify these behaviors. Ever since I've been trying to understand this pandemic, it has seemed much more likely that the COVID-19 might kill 0.6% of those infected in the United States. In that more realistic worst case scenario, we're talking about six times the scale of the average seasonal flu. We could have easily taken reasonable collective action to reduce the impact, which is natural but tragic. Encouraging extra hand washing this season and even socially distancing those over 65 could be very reasonable. But we did not need a controlled demolition of the economy, inevitable increases in the concentrations of wealth and inequity, with the first 3.3 million Americans filing claims for unemployment in the first couple weeks. And no, quote, capitalist megacorporation is too big to fail. So, dearest real and social media friends, please start including scientific studies and meta-analyses supporting each totalitarian reaction you are endorsing. Please figure out approximately how many different experiments provide the hard evidence directly for and against the given conclusions. How many of those experiments have been replicated at least once? If you want technocracy, then this is my minimal request. If the science that most people fucking love could never be used for evil, witting or unwitting, then Monsanto wouldn't exist, atomic bombs would never have dropped. The list of exponentially scaled man-made tragedies is long. We all love Newtonian physics that automate much of our lives, our electronic age, and the budding information age. But for nonlinear models of nature, most science lovers usually pass their vote directly to the scientific consensus of the moment, even if backed by just a few studies. Most formally educated minds have long been explicitly propagandized to do so, and now socially pressured others to follow orders. Some do not even want me to publicly question information and data used to endorse totalitarian policies. Please recognize just how totalitarian that is. Many of us had long had our eye on the gradual closing of the quote, freest society in the world, and can sometimes smell false authorities from a few news cycles away. You need us real skeptics to help keep the misuse of science in check. I completely agree this is not a political or partisan game, but as serious as life and death. I was too scared to speak up for eight years after 9-11, and I will not self-censor whenever we are forced to enter any post-something world. When in Oceania, do as the Oceanians do. Panic into endless wars against invisible enemies based on inadequate or privileged evidence. No, the military is not on most streets. No authority needs or wants to use physical control when they have mass mind control. If people were protesting or rioting in the streets, would you demand the militarized police enforce the scientific consensus? For now, there's still enough bread and circus for fun and chill in our brave new world. 62,400 repetitions make one truth, Bernard. It's an indisputable fact. But it could work better. Soma, just one gram and you won't give a damn. My apology if my tone feels harsh. I don't think I'm as scared as most who currently feel certain that if left unchecked, COVID-19 will kill millions or tens of millions globally. Instead, it seems much more likely and still massively tragic that 100 to 200,000 will have tested positive for COVID-19 playing some role in their death. This is closer to the range of the swine flu pandemic that did not upend the world economy. If this prediction ends up being more accurate, and if we never had identified and tracked COVID-19, it might have easily gone unnoticed this flu season.
And either way, we must keep working on big cofactors like healthcare and air pollution, which is directly toxic to our immune systems. I'm doing my best to stay calm and keep thinking clearly. Don't forget to take extra deep breaths and find comfort in our shared realities within the countless forms of love. I do hope that people stay healthy and that we can directly protect the most vulnerable, that healthcare is finally reformed and dramatically improved, and wish testing created actionable evidence a month or three ago. I still find it an extraordinary claim with insufficient evidence that the first 1 to 2,000 deaths in the U.S. will grow to some 1 to 2 million, the scale of predictions driving popular reactions. So I'm sad and scared about the totalitarian precedents set in reactions which thus far seem to be creating much greater human and social harm. If the new normal is holding the world hostage with weak data, then we need to sit down and have a serious talk about our social arrangement. How much of the country is similarly concerned about the new precedents for public consent and reshuffling the world? We won't know until we at least feel we can speak our minds and compare conclusions based on evidence.